fundamentally a matter of compliance with international norms. Therefore, although states like Nepal, undergoing a democratic tr transition, are certainly free to fashion their national constitutions and public institutions as they choose, call from UN and other international agencies exist, and the, prov the provisions of international treaties exist, I would like to argue that the most authoritative international norms relating to judicial processes are those entailed by the right to a fair trial as expressed in several global and regional human rights instruments including for example Article 10 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Broadly speaking it contains the following four or five core elements. First, in the determination of rights, obligations and criminal charges. Second, everyone is equally entitled. Third, to a fair, and subject to some exceptions, <coughs> limited exceptions, a public hearing. Four, by an independent and impartial tribunal established by law. And finally, fifthly, some instruments also add that trials should be conducted within a reasonable time. Now, of course, national courts are also sometimes required to resolve constitutional disputes between public institutions, but these tend to be quite rare compared with the determination of rights, obligations and criminal charges. Nepal is a party to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, but it is not, of course, a party to the European Convention on Human Rights. Nevertheless, for three main reasons I would like in this paper to consider how the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg has interpreted the right to be tried by an independent and impartial tribunal established by law under Article 6, 6 one of the European Convention on human rights is that the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights is by far the most developed of any international human rights tribunal on these and other issues. In the 50 years it has been in operation, the Strasbourg Court has delivered some 10,000 judgments. Over 90% of these have found at least one convention violation and over 70% of those have been violations of the right to fair trial under Article 6. It has, in other words, been careful to recognise that there are many equally legitimate ways in which the relevant basic principles can be applied in the diverse legal systems of the Convention's 47 member states. Thirdly, for both these reasons, this rich case law can be highly instructive even for non-European states such as Nepal where the Convention is not formally legally binding. But before looking more closely at how the Strasbourg Court has understood the right to be tried by an independent and impartial tribunal established by law, let me say something briefly about two other characteristics of modern democratic legal processes, transparency and accountability identified by the Nepalese Constituent Assembly's Committee on the Judicial System in the preface to its report on the preliminary draft constitution and concept paper. We deny that democratic judicial processes should be transparent and accountable. But these concepts do not mean the same in judicial as they do in non-judicial context. Indeed, the European Convention on Human Rights does not refer to transparency or to accountability of judicial processes as such at all. Indeed, Article 6 of the Convention seeks to make national judicial processes accountable to law and to make trials transparent by requiring them to be held in public and for a reasoned judgment to be delivered publicly. So another has been taken by the European Court of Human Rights to mean a judicial institution with several core characteristics. First, it should be established by statute, although it may be regulated by delegated legislation, provided this is subject to judicial review. Second, it must have jurisdiction 
to examine all relevant questions of fact and law. Third, it must be governed by rules of law. Fourth, it need not be staffed by professional judges, providing professional legal advice is available, as is the case with the English lay magistracy. Finally, its decisions must be legally binding. They must neither be predetermined by any binding interpretation of relevant law from a non-judicial authority, nor be capable of being subsequently overturned by any non-judicial authority. This Nevertheless, over the past few decades, there has been a clear trend in Europe and elsewhere away from legislative and towards judicial supremacy. But not all states have gone the full distance. For example, since the Human Rights Act 1998 came into force in the year 2000, the United Kingdom has modified its commitment to legislative supremacy, but without opting for full-blooded judicial supremacy instead. Nobody would disagree. Nevertheless, I would like to suggest that they can should be distinguished more sharply. Judicial independence firstly, is fundamentally a characteristic of the judiciary as an institution. It requires that the judiciary should be structurally separate from the parties and from other public and private institutions, particularly the government. Indeed, the 47 judges on the European Court of Human Rights itself are chosen by the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe although this is a consultative rather than a legislative body, from the lists of three candidates presented by the governments of each of the 47 member states. Although each appointee is the nominee of a particular state, once appointed they are expected to act independently and individual complaints against that state, that the convention has been violated by that state. And the reason it's been given that it's controversial amongst commentators on the Convention is to ensure that the domestic legal issues are under debate are properly understood. The second dimension of judicial independence, which has been of importance at Strasbourg, is that judicial terms of office are guaranteed against external interference or pressure, and in particular that judges can only be dismissed before their term of office expires for clear and serious wrongdoing, incapacity or incompetence. On the grounds that this creates the risk that judges may tailor their judgments in order to enhance their prospects of reappointment. But thirdly, for the European Court of Human Rights, it is not only the fact of independence which matters, courts must also be seen to be independent. The independence requirement will therefore curiously be deemed to have been breached where a particular court does not appear to be independent even though it in fact is independent, which was the main reason why the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom, which began to operate in October 2009, was established by the Constitutional Reform Act 2005. Hitherto, the UK's highest court the Judicial Committee of the House of Lords was formerly a committee of the Upper Chamber of the Legislature, which sat and delivered its judgments in the same building. Even the uh, House of the Judicial, Judicial Committee's most severe critics would not have contested in modern times that it was under the control of the Upper Chamber of the Legislature, nor that it otherwise lacked independence. But as a result of the consistently expressed view of the European Court of Human Rights in a ser series of cases against other states, the government of the UK thought it necessary for the appearance of independence physically to remove these judges from the Palace of Westminster where the House of Lords is accommodated and they now sit as a Supreme Court and their old, the same judges incidentally sit as a Supreme Court in their own building adjacent to Parliament. The fact that it regards the involvement of judges in the drafting of legislation before it is passed as a breach of judicial independence. However, the court accepts that judges may nevertheless legitimately refer legislation back 
to the legislature for revision once it has been passed, particularly when its constitutionality has been successfully challenged. So judges are inevitably in these circumstances involved in the legislative process, albeit in a kind of ex post facto uh, f fashion. Judicial impartiality, on the other hand, concerns the character of judicial proceedings. They must, in other words, be conducted in a manner which avoids, avoids the risk of actual personal judicial bias and or the appearance of personal judicial bias towards either party which could prejudice the trial process and or the verdict. <coughs> However, unlike independence, impartiality is an absolute standard. In other words, total impartiality is required. Being more or less impartial is not enough. So, the relationship between judicial independence and impartiality can be described as follows. A tribunal which is not structurally independent is unlikely to be impartial. But even a fully independent tribunal may not be impartial for contingent reasons. For example, by chance, a judge's personal interests may happen to coincide with the subject matter of the litigation over which he or she is expected to preside. Or also by chance, it may turn out that the judge has a personal connection with one of the parties. A year or so ago, the decision of the Judicial Committee of the House of Lords, which was then the UK's highest court, was set aside because a member of the panel, Lord Hoffman, had failed to declare <coughs> that his wife worked as a secretary for Amnesty International. The case concerned whether the former Chilean military dictator, Augusto Pinochet, was immune from prosecution in the UK for alleged crimes against humanity committed in Chile, and Amnesty International was one of the parties to litigation. So although Lord Hoffman was not himself personally connected with Amnesty International, there was a risk, albeit a remote one, that he might have been subtly influenced by his wife's connection. But perhaps more importantly, his wife's involvement with Amnesty International created the appearance of a lack of impartiality, even if Lord Hoffman had nevertheless not been influenced by it. The best suggested that Nepal and other non-European states can nevertheless learn a great deal about what this means from the rich jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights on Article 6 of the European Convention. And finally, third and finally, the key characteristic, the key lesson I think that they can learn is that this case law identifies a range of secondary principles from the primary principles found in the text of Article 6.1. Yet the court, correctly in my view, has always refrained from seeking to prescribe precise mechanisms of implementation. Elaborated on the issues of judicial independence and impartiality in Europe, he fairly uh, in detail, he dealt with the European experience, particularly the judgment given by the European Court of Human Rights, and also he reflected on the experiences of the British system. He had underlined the importance of the democratic norms and also the international standards to be followed in any constitution making process. He underlined the need for having a very good link between independence and impartiality. And there are a couple of cautions also to be followed. So the rich jurisprudence, as he explained, that exists with the European system is very important for us to learn. And his deliberation has encouraged us to more, to learn more from it and also where possible reflect in our country. I would like to thank you very much, Professor Greer. Now I would like to call upon Professor Ji Chen. She's speaking on constitutional review system in Nepal's draft constitution. She has been working with the University of Sinhua, right? I would like to call upon the professor to speak on your team. It is a knowledge, but also with our um, all-hearted um, efforts. Um, in the coming May, uh, Nepal will have one of the uh, model constitution in the world. Um, the topic I'm going to address um, is about the constitutional review in Nepal, which is one of the most significant topic in uh, constitutional law uh, study. Uh, and its significance is almost as obvious as, um, you know, we, we don't really need to prove it at all. Especially after World War II, after the tragedy in Germany under the Weimar Constitution, uh, many realized that with owning 
the good intention of uh, rights um, and other uh, good institutions, but without entrenchment of those uh, rights and institutions, then constitution will turn into um, you know nothing but a uh, written uh, word. Um, on the other hand, um, we find that the constitution making process in Nepal is very encouraging um, because as the youngest republic, certain values have already been uh, reached by uh, consensus over the past few years, including democracy, rule of law, um, um, secularism. Um, I'm here not to provide any uh, good models because China is not famous for its uh, justiciability of the constitutional law. However, uh, I'm able to be here to provide some of the, um, probably the adverse examples of how a constitution cannot work if a entren entrenchment institution is not built into the constitution. On the other hand, um, since China has been such a big country, and also because of uh, the dynamic developments over the past 10 years, in some of the regional um, uh, localities in China, there have been some interesting experiments um, in, in those kind of countries of regions. Uh, I'm going to um, address this topic from um, six different aspects. Um, but I'm going to start from the uh, foundations of um, different models of constitutional review. Uh, since most of you are already experts in constitutional law or uh, government um, study, I'm not going to uh, elaborate too much on this. But basically, um, ever since the 1970s, Professor Capvelli had tried to categorize the constitutional reviews into two basic models the uh, centralized model and then the decentralized model. But over those uh, over years, those two models are probably not enough to describe the new developments of constitutional review. The second model was developed after World War II because of the sort of failure of Weimar constitution when people in um, Western European countries with civil law tradition realized that uh, they need some more um, specialized constitutional bodies to review the constitutionality of laws which may violate human rights, even though uh, those laws, um, if properly implemented, look like they have followed the rule of law tradition. Um, so from this perspective, I'd like to say that the centralized judicial review model uh, reflect not only uh, the aspect of rule of law, but also uh, some extra values of human rights and uh, democracy. Because, And the third model uh, is centralized but non-judicial review body, which was created also after World War II by the French um, uh, government. And this model um, had now some new developments since last year um, because this model also emphasized on the principle of parliamenta uh, parliamentarianism. Um, so at the very beginning, uh, this Council of <coughs> Constitution uh, does not review the laws after the laws are promulgated in order to respect the process of the legislature. So they, they will review the laws passed by the legislature but have not promulgated it uh, as a formal law. So by doing the institutionality of the lawmaking process. And finally, um, over the past 20 years, there have been uh, a new comprehensive review system developed over many other countries. Uh, early this morning, um, the uh, Chief Justice from Finland also introduced the uh, constitutional review process in Finland and it sort of reflects a comprehensive process of where um, both the court and the um, legislature could review the um, 
uh, review and interpret the constitutional law um, at some uh, at different stages. So it, government branches of different natures. Um, overall, we find that all these um, models were um, designed or were created under certain principles, but at the same time, they will have to compromise at certain uh, stage of at certain extent because all the uh, political realities and also from time to time the checks and balances requirements ask the court if as the reviewer body or the parliament uh, which as the uh, representative of the uh, sovereignty to compromise with either principles of separation of powers or to compromise um, with some um, realistic uh, demand from uh, interest groups. So I laid down four different uh, reasons for compromise um, while keeping the principles um, and values of the Constitution. Those are the political issues and limits of rule of law. And then it's important to keep all the players um, on the same table so that they can keep on um, having dialogues with each other with or without a reach, reaching on uh, a specific consensus at the very moment. And based on these theories and practices and some kind of generations, generalizations of the models, um, I looked into the um, draft um, prepared um, by the uh, Constituent Assembly and found those four uh, different features of the constitutional review system. The first um, I found is that um, the Supreme Court uh, is supposed to be the interpreter of the constitution and the review body. Um, however, secondly, there's a limit of the bulk review. Um, um, my understanding of positions elected by the legislature could include a lot of uh, important uh, posts uh, in Nepal. Uh, which sort of in excludes quite a few um, possibilities of the uh, judiciary to uh, sort of examine the constitutionality of certain either actions of um, orders or other decisions passed by those um, important posts. And third is that the lower level courts do not expect to interpret constitutional law uh, or other uh, federal laws either. Um, Instead, um, finally, the fourth feature is that the Federal Legislature Special Judicial Council, which was one of the uh, committees created by the legislature, has the power to interpret the Constitution and federal laws and the matters relating to positions of the persons of national importance of matters directly concerning politics. On the one hand, impossible for the judiciary to um, interfere with the political process or those processes where the political bodies claim there's a political um, feature of interest in it. So, and secondly, without a full authority of interpretation, the Supreme Court's jurisdiction to hear cases between the constitutional bodies, which is laid down by the draft, um, and between the central and provinces will make little sense because um, from the practices of many other jurisdictions, we find that many of those uh, constitutional issues out of constitutional bodies or um, between the central and local governments um, will um, more or less uh, either related to those positions or persons elected by the legislature or they will have some um, connection uh, directly with the politics. So, and the third uh, confusion is that uh, the legitimacy of the special judicial com committee to review constitutionality of the federal law is not sufficient, um, given the fact that the members are elected by the legislature, so they are um, not, um, you know, superior to other members of the legislature. They are even like in directly elected by the people other than directly uh, elected by the people as the members of the legislature. So my question to uh, the draft uh, or late 
uh, down as the uh, following three. The first thing is that um, if we look at the uh, draft um, topic five, uh, number four and three and four, it looks like um, Nepal is going to create a judicial review uh, model of, cons of constitutional review. It, so it will be um, the centralized judicial review because uh, model because the local uh, judges are not supposed to review the constitutionality of laws. However, with this uh, special judicial committee, um, the uh, model of judicial review of Nepal sort of changed into model four, which is the comprehensive one. However, as a comprehensive um, model of uh, constitutional review, um, the special committee will need more authority than just being elected by uh, the legislature. It could be difficult um, to tell whether or not a specific case is related to positions of the persons of national importance and matters directly concerning politics. Uh, it could also be controversial uh, itself. Um, here I, I take an example of um, one of the most important cases uh, in Hong Kong uh, right after uh, the reunification with the mainland in 1999 where the Court of Final Appeals uh, of Hong Kong uh, had different understanding of uh, what does autonomous issues mean uh, in the basic law. You know, when appeals believe that whether or not one should have right to a vote is a pure autonomous issue. Um, and since there's no uh, third uh, authority or no independent authority to address this question, it almost create a constitutional crisis for that reason. So it's also possible in the future that in Nepal, um, this special judicial committee may have different understanding of what, what, it, what are the issues that could be categorized as pure political issue or could be categorized as um, fall into the uh, categories of, of the Judicial Committee uh, as, as opposed to the Supreme Court of the federal uh, level. And finally, as the uh, federal government, um, we didn't see any uh, provisions on the uh, function of provincial level constitutional law nor have we seen any of those um, functions of local courts um, to play a role in the uh, checks over the constitutionality of those provincial level constitution, uh, the, the, the provincial level laws. Um, so I'm going to conclude um, my um, um, thoughts uh, with, the, with, with this final um, ideas. The first is that if for historical theoretical reasons the courts are not supposed to be the best organization to uh, be the reviewer of the constitutionality of laws, as in some uh, other countries like in France or in some um, countries with a parliamentary sovereignty tradition, then a more independent body should be created to replace the parliamentary uh, legislature so that um, um, the review body will um, uh, be able to work independently without interferences of different political um, interest groups. Finally, uh, whichever model Nepal is going to take, um, it will need time and practice to examine whether or not this kind of model will work in Nepal. Um, as a matter of fact, many of the constitutional courts, including the U.S. Supreme Court and the uh, Conseil de, uh, d'Etat, now Conseil de Constitutionnel, uh, takes uh, either 20 to 30 years until the first constitution case, constitutional law case um, came before the court or before the court uh, sort of dare to take care of these kind of cases. Of course, on the other hand, um, if the judiciary is active enough, like the Court of Final Appeals in Hong Kong, um, with the common law tradition, uh, it may also create history um, by its practice. Um, thank you for your patience.
chain, uh, with one sort of presentation you have been able to explain about the different models of the constitutional review. And besides, you also build further on it and keep both models. I wonder how, being a foreigner, how sharply you put, you have been able to put your eye on the most uh, important issue that we have been discussing over time here in the pro of the Constituent Assembly as well as outside of the Constituent Assembly. These are the important issues that we are discussing so much and you have been making a very clear cut observation on the uh, challenges, on the cautions that we need to focus on. So you have been very straightforward. I appreciate your straightforward observation. Thank you very much for your presentation. Now, I would like to call upon Professor Purushottam Kulkarni, a senior advocate in India. His topic is Aspects of Social Justice, Lessons from India, and you will be dealing with in your deliberation would be obviously very important. I would like to call upon Professor Kulkarni to make the presentation. I'd like to put some points before you for your consideration and discussion. From the point of view of the social justice, what I have in my mind is what is expected by a common man from the constitution. A common man is least bothered, I would rather say that he is not bothered at all whether you have a parliamentary system or whether you have a presidential system, whether you have election commission or whether you have something in the constitution. What he is bothered is that whether tomorrow I will get the food or not, whether I have got a good house or not, whether the house where I am living would sustain in this particular rainy season or not. So we have to address this particular aspect from this point of view. The deliberations which are there are absolutely right, they are required, whether we have got a parliamentary system, independence of the judiciary and all these things. But what I feel is that less attention is paid to this important aspect of the constitution. We feel that after declaration of the fundamental rights and the directive principles of the state responsibility, what the state should or state is supposed to do for a common man, our job is over. Now what we usually do is that whatever how the enforcement of the fundamental right or the directive principle we give to the political party in the power or the government or the bureaucracy. Now there is a there is an imperative out of this is that these days there, it has been an experience in different countries or rather the neighboring countries of Nepal. Take for example India, Bangladesh or say Sri Lanka as Professor Adesina pointed out in the morning. Whether President A comes or President B comes the situation would be the same. So therefore, in this particular situation, if we hand over this implementation of the enforcement of the fundamental rights and the directive principles, which are essential aspects of the social justice to the political party, we know that these particular schemes for the poor people are declared or tried to be implemented in order to achieve political mileage. So therefore, everything these days is looked upon from the political mileage as a vote bank politics and therefore, there is a necessity that we must have a system which would go beyond this particular political aspect or politicizing the institution. And therefore what I have in my mind and which I want to put for your consideration and the discussion is that why not build a mechanism, a system in the constitution itself giving less leverage or the opportunity to the political parties or the government or the bureaucracies to work upon it. Then suppose if we have a body in the constitution itself defining its scope, its activity, its powers, its spheres of work, then perhaps it can be achieved that what are the needs of a common man, what is required to be done. Such body, if it is established, can have say, offices in the provinces like we have election commission, which has got offices in different provinces, and they take into consideration the requirement, the so, list of the voters and all these things. So like this, this body will have offices in different provinces where the needs of the common man will be taken into consideration. They will be forwarded to the government. At least some impartiality would be there. Such type of collection of a data and making a provision for them or ensuring that, that the social justice aspects are properly and effectively met with will be beyond some political aspect or vote bank politics or politicizing every issue which has become a habit of some of the countries these days is the major reason in many developing countries such schemes are declared considerable funds are allocated international aid is also declared for such type of schemes 
in newspaper or in media you will find that certain minister comes there and declares that we have declared a scheme for poor people and all these things thereafter what happens to that we don't know how the funds are used we don't know the plight of the common man continues to be there and he remains as he is in spite of huge funds allotted spent reports are prepared so therefore what is need to be done is that such type of schemes should be handed over to such type of a body where the constitution of that body would be beyond politics or different say provincial representation would be there or representation from different political bodies would be there to such type of a body so therefore in this particular situation it would be ensured that whatever scheme which has been declared by the government it really reaches to that particular person for whose benefit the scheme has been declared there has to be some transparency in that now for the purpose of the transparency what is required to be done is that right from the declaration of the scheme the allocation of the funds for particular scheme how it is being implemented how amount has been spent if this particular report is published to the people then perhaps the questioning ability of the people would be raised and that would put some check on the bureaucracy on the minister on the political party who declare such type of scheme majority of such type of schemes are declared by these people only for their personal benefits so therefore corruption which is a major aspect has to be dealt with very seriously in the constitution itself as i said that if we leave everything to the political party which comes into the power and we think it would be too naive to think that the political party would be working for the poor people only because what they have in their mind is after 5 years what they are going to do so uh, for such type of thing they have to collect some material to go before the people after 5 years and therefore only declaration the facade which is created by these people that yes we have spent so many people for the poor but i am the last man in the country i don't know what you are talking about a single rupee has not come to me and you are speaking of spending of crores of rupees for that so that has to be avoided like to submit is that it is also why this thing is necessary is it has been an experience in different countries like the countries which i have mentioned just now there is a rise of militant organizations in all these different countries i think that the poverty is one of the main issues for giving rise to such type of a militancy when a common man or a poor man feels that he is not looked upon by his government he resorts to arm or rather he succumbs to the pressure of the militant organizations who would seduce him to these principles and then we have got so many problems about that of course again i would say that it would be too naive to say that the poverty is the only reason for creation of the militant organizations there are so many other reasons but what i feel is that this is the basic reason if you address to the need of a common man in a proper manner then perhaps to a greater extent we can avoid rise to such type of militant organizations so this also has to be given a very serious thought in india you see because of the vastness of the area vastness of the population the problem which are faced by us are grave but nonetheless the situation in nepal is similar maybe that because of the small country the problem may be to a lesser extent but all the same we have to address these problems in this particular manner transparency the second aspect related to this particular social justice point of view is which is very uh, become a point of discussion in india is the judicial activism now judicial activism in india has gone to such an extent whether it is right or wrong we will see that even the supreme court and the high courts have given the decision what should be the height of the speed breaker on the road whether the monkeys in a particular provinces are to be caught and in which particular jungle they are to be left such type of things if you consider as a judicial activism and the decisions of the court which would go to the help of a common man what i feel is that judicial activism is not a solution in itself for meeting the ends of the social justice from the short term game it's okay i am very pleased today because the court has come to my help but in the long run it would be a dangerous thing to have such type of a judicial activism without any bounds or without any limitations we know that the three organs of the democratic society like say uh, legislature the judiciary and the executive they have got their own spheres of activity they have got their own limitations 
but because of the apathy of the executive body or the government in meeting with the ideas of the social justice or ensuring social justice the courts are required to take upon themselves this particular aspect of meeting the ends of the justice that has to be stopped we cannot all the time rely upon such type of judicial activism or we we, we cannot you see promote such type of judicial activism because it all depends upon the judges the the ideas of the judges we know that the real school of law is there so considering all these aspects in the long run judicial activism should not be seen as an answer to meeting the ends of the social justice and therefore there is a more need that let us have some inbuilt mechanism in the constitution itself for meeting with the needs of a common man how effectively it can be done would be some points which would be would be considered or to be deliberated upon by the by by that particular society in itself of course there are disadvantages of right to information act also that can be thought of and those defects can be removed from the law the major disadvantage of right to information act in india is any day a person gets up makes an application to the government office and calls for the information without any reason so every government office is required to appoint an officer who is called as a public officer for giving information to the people and leaving all aside his work he is just to deal collect the information from his office and pass it on to the person who has asked that information the earlier idea or the deliberations of the constituent assembly in providing this reservation for a certain period of time was absolutely well thought of but now see what has happened is that now it has become a political issue and what i feel today is those reservations even after 15 years or rather say 50 years after the constitution they are continued till today and in my opinion the reservation will not go away why because it has become a political issue i fight for you if i maintain reservation for you well you will give a vote to me and after 5 years i'll be elected that is how the whole issue is looked upon in india and therefore the reservation has become a very dangerous game in india while considering this aspect i have also seen that there are so many minority commissions or commissions for different types of people the marginalized some such type of thing is being thought of in the nepali constitution also but the danger is that it affects the merit and it creates an understanding in the mind of such type of person that i have got a right to take everything ready made from the government even if i am lazy even if i don't work or even if i don't do anything the government is bound to do these things for me because it is provided in the constitution affecting the merit in such a manner you might have heard that few the in educational institution a student having say 50% mark is given an admission and a person having 95% mark doesn't get the admission because the quota is filled in by filling up the backward class category now there is so much frustration in the mind of these students who have who have taken very efforts in getting excel in the examination there is no solution for them like this is not an answer you give a reservation to such people for few years you help them to become self sufficient you must you must motivate them to excel in whatever field they want to work after a particular time period give the reservation to economically weak weaker section rather than giving the reservation on caste and creed this if it is not done there is a danger of the society becoming absolutely divided in india we are feeling like that that it may be given a serious thought that having transparency in the matter of social justice the implementation of the fundamental rights and the directive principles of the social or uh, directive principles of the state responsibility an independent body in the constitution itself will be created it will have better sanctity the second is that right of information act a statute similar to that may be thought of to give transparency to the public administration in a country the third is that the reservation policy for the backward class people must be on the basis of all these aspects because once you make a provision you be sure considering the fact that in nepal and in india it is the same social system social setup once you incorporate reservation like this virtually it will be impossible for you to remove that and whatever we are facing in india will be faced by in nepal after 15 years or after 20 years so
Thank you very much, Professor Kutani. So then what the, the mechanism you have suggested would be uh, an important thing to be considered by the constituent assembly. The issue that you have touched upon, the implementation of the Right to Information Act, that is very much a very uh, heated uh, issue in India these days, and that has also promoted the transparency of the public organization, that is also a dear. And other issue that the interim constitution has underlined is the issue of reservation, and the new constitution also will be making some headway on that. So the reservation then, it has to be taken in a proper context, uh, the idea behind having the reservation is to promote the special, temporary special measures to alleviate the status of the marginalized people. But if the case is overused or misused or abused, then that would bring out some more problems. So how to take it in the proper context and uh, give a you know, reasonable set that is a very challenging issue again to be dealt with by the Constituent Assembly. I hope your uh, deliberation on it would have generated more interest and a more you know, thought-provoking mindset of our uh, learned the, uh, the speech by our learned speakers. Now this is the turn for inviting our learned commentators. Now I would like to call upon Advocate Sambhu Thapa, former president of Nepal Bar Association, I would like to call upon to make you comment on that, and uh, I would I should not demand that you have 10 minutes only. The Mandal Commission, it was Brindisur Mandal at the time of the Janta Dal. It was commissioned. Then it gathered dust for more than 10 years. Then at the, at the time of the BP Singh, it started to get implementation if a guy were burning and till now there is the same debate what Mr. Kulkarni has explained the position of India regarding the issue of Dalit, regarding the issue of untouchable or uh, backward people or downtrodden. To uphold the position of the untouchable, downtrodden people and they are taking one very lenient view. So in our respect also, we don't know whether uh, there would be the commission or not uh, to study the real features, characteristics of untouchable that is Dalit or any poorer section of the society. Then the second issue, what you said, that uh, uh, right to information, it is Judge A.P. Shah. Judge A.P. Shah, who is the Chief Justice of the Delhi High Court, he was, uh, you know, the very, uh, 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 very dynamic judge, but he never picked up to the Supreme Court of India. This is also one problem because one judge, I have read one article regarding his picking up from the High Court to the Supreme Court, even though your second judge's case that clearly says there will be the five judges yeah, to give final step to the recommendation of the government. So, APSA Recently, he was presiding whether the post of the Chief Justice should be uh, uh, transparent or not. And he said he should be transparent on the terms of the uh, property, on the terms of the financial regularities, everything he said. So my point is that, so even in Nepal, now, I would like to pick up some points <laughs> that in Nepal, I don't know Mr. Khimlal Dev Kota, how he will uh, give his comment. In Nepal, their allegation to the judge is that every judges are corrupt. They, 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 yeah, they, whenever we say the 
you know the why we want to take away the very jurisdiction of the uh, judicial review everybody we know that meaning of the judicial review it declares it holds the the unconstitutionality of any act of the public body it may be parliament it may be any officer of the government so they say no every judge yeah, in your vicious circle of your court from district court to supreme court they are corrupt they are inefficient they are inept this kind of the allegation always yeah, we hear power of the judicial review that power we have been exercising since 1951 under the act of the pradhan nyayalaya in we can say we can give him the translation of that act is apex court act we can say it has been starting since 1951 and in the uh, 58 59 constitution it was incorporated in the constitution thereafter even in the panchayat regimes constitution also it was there and in 1990 constitution loudly it provides even to give the role uh, in the social justice context also that is the judicial activism or we can say the public in interest litigation supreme court can take any uh, issue as a public interest litigation she highlighted some points that uh, there could be some model even from the parliamentary committee that could also review the very basic question is that ralsian philosophy fairness that will be jeopardized before the raul if we go adam smith independent spectator and if we come to the social choice theory that impartiality that means the fairness fairness means not only in terms of the decision making but also in terms of the appointment of the judiciary also that 11 committee from the you know there is a provision in chinese constitution it says supreme court will be accountable to the people's congress it is the provision in the chinese constitution from yesterday opening remark we have been hearing we have been our very learned speaker they have been saying us don't make the hybrid document now they also say that party also says and gives a stand that there should be the independent of the judiciary but it should be accountable to the people of the congress like it should be accountable to the 